All right, then, if you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to begin reading in verse 47. 1 Corinthians 15, kind of a long uh, reading, and so we're going to just get the last uh, few verses. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 47. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, says this, The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is, is of the Lord from heaven. I'm sorry, the second man is the Lord from heaven. As it is the earthy, such are also that they are earthy. And as it is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall bring, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. But this I say unto you, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I shew you, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all fall asleep, but we shall be changed, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying which is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, but the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its provision in our own language. Lord, we thank you that you have kept it so well for 400 plus years now, and that it sets before us, and too often we take it for granted. Lord, we thank you uh, for your loving son, Jesus. Lord, for his sacrificial death on our behalf, on our part, Lord, we praise you for that. God, we pray now that you would bless your word to the hearts of the ears, Lord, and that you be in the center of all things. We pray these things in the sweet and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, fairly familiar verses of Scripture. Uh, I certainly believe that the Apostle Paul is relating, and really if I understand the, the, the sequentialness of the Bible, this is the first time that he gives us a peek at the catching away. And us going home to be with the Lord bodily if we remain until the Lord comes. Uh, prior to that, he gets into what this is really made out of. And, and the longer I try to serve the Lord seemingly, the more this flesh resists against it. Uh, by the time I was 53 years old, uh, going on 54, I thought this thing would be a little bit better. But if anything, it's worse. It's more difficult to handle than it was even uh, 25 years ago. And, and so we find then that Paul uh, puts this to a test or gives it, or puts it in very specific terms. In verse 48, he begins, uh, we'll read verse 47, the first man is of the earth, earthy. Now, of course, he's literally talking about the, uh, the first man, Adam, being formed out of the dust of the ground. But I want you to see your natural flesh is, is bent toward the earth, right. the world. We enjoy worldly things. And anybody that tells you they don't, uh, they're lying to you. Uh, because this flesh has not yet been put off. Now, they may keep the flesh a little bit better abated than you, 
But you do not change this nature of this flesh ever, ever, ever. Uh, that's, uh, that's the difference or one of the many differences I'll put between us and holiness people. They really believe that this flesh one day will arrive at the ultimate. That's not happened. Uh, one time many years ago, I was preaching over at the nursing home, and I, I got on the grass a little bit. There was a little Pentecostal woman visiting her mama, man, she got excited. And after I was done preaching, because as you all know, I usually end up, <laughs> my preaching with turn to Jesus. That's the only thing I know to tell you. And I ended that, and she busted the box up there to me and goes, well, you left out receiving the Holy Ghost. And I said, oh, no. I said, I, I, I believe that. I said, I just don't believe it like you do. And uh, she goes, well, I, he's made me eternal. And I said, well, why is your hair gray? Uh -huh. And uh, she turned and went the other way. And, uh, but that's very true. And that, you know, your hair graying, your deep wrinkles developing, and all that goes with that is just a testament to this. This body is sinful. And there's never a time to put that away. And, and so he reminds them of their condition. You're earthy. You're bent toward this way. The second man, the regenerate man, the second man is the Lord from heaven. So we had the first man, Adam, earthy in nature. We had the second man, the Lord Jesus Christ, completely holy, completely pure, everything existing in him. There's two types. Now, you're one or you're both. If you're one this evening, you're on your way to hell. If you've been born again and you're like to the uh, Son of the living God, you'll be in glory one day. I don't know when it'll be or if you'll go through the grave or if you'll go through the catching away or how you might go, but one way or the other. So he designs and lets us understand from the beginning of the text, we are two people in one. Don't ever think you've got this flesh hooked. Because I guarantee you, if you got that, if you get that thing, it's got you hooked. <laughs> and, and so we see Paul makes it very plain. Verse 48, as is the earthy, or the things of the earth, such are also, uh, such are they also that are earthy. So they're like the things of this earth. Uh, they are appealing. Uh, you go into a clothing store and you see all the mannequins all set up and expensive clothes draped over for them. That's appealing to the flesh. It's earthy. It's carnal. It, it is kind of who we are. And Paul makes it very clear that huh, we're bent that way as the earthy, such also they that are earthy. So if that is your pull, if that's your constant tug, then you're earthy. And as it is in heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. Now, I'll tell you what, and uh, praise be to God, at least one time a day I think about going home to be with the Lord Jesus. Uh, I, I can't really fathom in my mind what glory might be like, but I do get excited about it, and I do think about it, and I do know that someday I'll be there, and, and not that I'm so great, but you can compare this to yourself, huh, it's a heavenly-minded thing. You know, lost people don't ever even consider that, do they? The, the, the devil is very sly and very cunning, and they don't even think about eternity that much. Because they've got other things to think about, other fish to fry. And, and so we see then that we as the Lord's people, that's a measurement of your, uh, in your true relationship with Christ. Do you think on the heavenly things? Verse 49. And as we have borne the image of earthy, we shall bear the image of the heavenly. Well, what a wonderful thought that one thing, one day this can be discarded and we will bear the image of the very living Son of God. You remember it says there in the Revelation they were robed in white raiment. We'll be uh, walking up down the streets of glory one day, riding down from glory on white horsebacks to do the bidding of God. What a wonderful, exciting time that will be. You know what? That's a heavenly-minded thing. And the world would like you to think on anything but that. That's right. Yeah. 
And But you know what? Victory is coming for the redeemed. And uh, this church, listen, it was in a mess, was it not? And if he was, if he was building a church in such a mess as the church at Corinth to think on these things, what would he have for us? Uh, what would he have us to use our time to think about? Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, that's something you need to uh, uh, you commit to memory because just like that Pentecostal woman I talked to that night, uh, don't know whether that woman's living or dying now. I haven't even saw her in probably 30 years, 20 years. But she wasn't holy. That's the deception of that doctrine. They're not holy. They're just as corrupt as I am. They have to be changed. Mm -hmm. Now the inward man, yeah. when you're born, that inward man is corrupt too. Yeah. Yeah. It's just as corrupt as this flesh. Yeah. But the intervention of the Almighty can make it new again. Mm -hmm. It can make it sinless. It can make it bend its nature toward God when nothing else will. That's the inward man. So at some point in uh, moving toward the Lord God, the two have to match. Now, uh, it may well be that y'all plant me out here in the lot next to the church, and even so, come Lord Jesus, that will be fine. Because the good thing, the Bible says this, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You see, I'll be changed that way. Don't wait for me. Don't, don't be stressed, uh, stressed out about it. Uh, I will be at home with the Lord, and that's a changing. Yeah. That I will be something different than I am now. Uh, the inward man one day will match the, out, the outward man and will no longer have to be bothered with his flesh. Then he says this, neither, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So he's saying in the second part of verse 50 there that this is corrupt. That this is a filthy, ungodly being. And he said it cannot inher inherit eternity. This body cannot receive the things of the Almighty. Verse 51, Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we sh shall be changed. Mm -hmm. um, what, a, what a glorious thought that is. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that's been passed on to us and passed on to this. And Bible haters will take this verse and try to say, Well, every one of them people are dead now. Well, the message goes on. It goes on to me. It goes on to you. Uh, my grandchildren are here tonight, and it may be in their time. I don't know. But I do know this. Some will be living at the return of Christ, sure. and they will be called away. And huh, have you ever thought about that? And I don't get into these catch and wave movies, whatever it's called. Um, uh, but can you imagine... Uh, <laughs> Him trying to explain it all the way. Now, first of all, I don't think it'll be a ripple in the pond because half the people that claim redemption, I don't think they're more saved than North is from the South. <coughs> but they'll have to come up with something, will they not? Mm -hmm. I saw a very, uh, a very uh, to me, moving, uh, very appropriate for our day uh, picture on Facebook today. And it had the government uh, having this string and the TV in the middle of it and then all going out to different parts of the world doing like this, like it was a puppet. And they'll, they'll explain it away. <clears throat> don't, don't stress about that. <laughs> because uh, they certainly don't want them to understand that the living God of the Bible is doing exactly what he always said that he would do. So we've got to be changed. In a moment, and that is that quick, not even a measured second. In a moment, <laughs> in, 
in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Mm. Now what a, what a wonderful thought that uh, the, the, dead, the dead will put on incorruptible. Now, uh, I certainly don't pretend to understand how this will come to pass. Uh, is graves going to burst open? I don't know. I, I really don't know. Uh, I know they did in the resurrection of Christ, but uh, I don't know how to transpire. But I do know this, it's going to happen. And we're going to be at home with the Lord Jesus Christ. And this flesh will finally match the inward man. It'll, it'll match my spirit. You know, have you ever even considered this? And uh, the older I get, the more I like to think on eternity. The Bible says this, there will be neither male nor female. Um, I, I don't know how I look. I don't, uh, <laughs> the Bible says in one place you'll be known as you're known. Right. But I don't think, oh, there, there's Larry. I don't know. Uh, how am I really known? I trust to God I'm known by God, by his dear son. Right? I, I, I don't know how it will go, be, it, it will go down, but I do know that huh, we are going to, huh, we're going to be out of here. We're going to be done. We're going to go home to be with the Lord forevermore. So when this corruptible, this flesh, shall be put on incorruption, which is the new man, and this mortal shall have put in on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, which is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Yeah. Now, from the very beginning of your life, you've heard about death, right? Uh, I can't even really remember the first person I knew that died. I know the per first person in my family that I can remember died was my great grandmother. And, and I remember that quite vividly. I was not quite four years old. And I, I, I still remember it very, very well. But there were other people in the community that died before her that I have little glimpses of memory from. But that has always been a part of my life. And it's always been a part of your life. But you know, there's victory that extends far past death. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and we don't need to stress about it. We don't need to be upset about it because we'll live on and on and on and on. I can't describe it. I can't fully understand it. I just know that we will. And at the very least, we'll be with the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the seats of sages. You know what? That's heaven enough for me. The, that, that does well. Uh, be very satisfied with it. And, and so we find that Paul gives this revelation uh, to the redeemed that this is not it. Things are going to get better. Now I want you to see death is swallowed up in victory. Now when something is swallowed up, it's gone, it's done with. Oh death, where is thy sting? Oh grave, where is thy victory? Huh. The sting is gone. Victory belongs unto Christ, not unto death. The victory is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know him tonight? Do you understand and, and, and marvel at his being and, and marvel at who he is and marvel at the ability he has to change lives, to save you? The victory is in Jesus. We sing that all the time. Oh, victory in Jesus. But do you believe it? This is a clear example that victory lies in Christ. You need to know him. You need to understand him. Uh, know who he is. <laughs> Therefore, my beloved brethren, verse 58, be steadfast, understanding that this is not it, understanding that the victory lies in Christ, understanding we're going to see people laid to rest in the lot next to the church, with all that said and with all that understanding, because we see the victory is in Jesus, therefore, my beloved brethren, be you, be ye steadfast. Now, he says that so easily. 
and it's so hard to do. Think about 20 years ago, 25, 20 years ago, me and Don and the children used to start, when we first started traveling to other states to preach and go to different places, it was a different time. And I've thought of time and time again, I saw Mike Huffman the other night, the uh, other day, he and I were talking along these lines. What's changed? What's different now? Where did that zeal go away to? We're not steadfast. See, God don't change, but we do. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he, he, he reminds those people, you want to be victorious when you begin to think on the end of your life, be you steadfast. That, that's how you don't stress about it. That's how you don't get upset. You, you, you have to be steadfast. And sometimes it will be the most difficult thing you will ever do. You know, uh, now my ministry is almost 28 years old. And I've always preached <laughs> salvation by grace and women dressing like women and men dressing like men. That's two elements of my ministry that's never changed. You know what it's got me? Look around the building tonight. That's what it got me, right? You know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to stress out. I'm going to be steadfast. And the Lord being my helper, I'll preach it to the day I die. But it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's very, very difficult. Because you know what? Back then, 20 years ago, folks, people enjoyed that kind of preaching. They don't anymore. No. They're not steadfast. Be steadfast, unmovable. They're being moved, are they not? They're, they're, they're being moved very much by the world. That's what, that is what's occurring. Making the things of this world become appealing. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You, you want to be encouraged tonight? Abound in the things of the Lord. You want to be, uh, you want to be, uh, uh, glorifying to him abound in the work of the Lord. Now that doesn't mean just doing the work of the Lord. It says abound in it. You know, if you fertilize your garden, it, ab it abounds. It, it comes up. It's healthy. It's strong. It bears fruit. That's what he wants from us. Abound in the Lord. We need that. Yeah. You want to make it to the next time around? Abound in the Lord. And listen, don't measure yourself by this world. Amen. That's not abounding. <laughs> That's abounding in the world. It's not abounding in the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter how many people meet with you. The Lord God promised if he met with us, he'd fill the house. That's all we need, right? That's all, that's all, that's the only thing we need. So uh, as Paul is writing toward the end, uh, how we'll go up, he reminds the church at Corinth of these things, living in victory. Now go with me very quickly and we'll uh, be done. First Thessalonians chapter four, and we see Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica, the very same message. I have to see that the third church in Thessalonica, and it was a Greek church, just like Corinth, and uh, they must have been discouraged by this point. You know what? When you leave the way you were raised, don't expect to enjoy it. See, those Grecians had more... Uh, more gods than I got on top of my head, the hair on top of my head. And when you turn your back on things like that, remember this, you're turning your back on your family too because they're not going to want anything to do with you. They're not willing to embrace you anymore. And you know what? It's discouraging. I've experienced it myself. I, I, I am saying from someone who knows, it's not pleasant. <coughs> 
And so, no doubt they were discouraged. No doubt they were uh, down and out, uh, being made fun of their fellow Grecians. And notice as Paul begins to see in verse 13, no doubt they were stressed about people who had died in the faith. In verse 13 he says, But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, talking to the church, uh, talking to the sisters as, as well, talking to the group. But I would not have you be ignorant. So the first thing that we find in this, it's possible to be ignorant of the second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have said don't be ignorant if that wasn't a possibility. You know what? It's been written away, taken off the block for many people today. Uh, you know, the, you know that is the uh, most dangerous part of being all millennial is you have to take away the second coming of Christ. You have to take the tribulation out for that to be a realistic thing. That's the biggest danger. And, and so we find then that these individuals, that this. Uh, we're stressed about it. I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others that have no hope. Again, again, back to the very same thing, studying about the cemetery, studying about the graveyard, stressed about mother and daddy, stressed about them having gone on, and they died in the faith and the promises of this book, physically they never seen, and now they were upset about it. Listen. Don't get upset about the physical. If you do that, you're going to worry yourself to death. Right. Look at it with your spiritual eye. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That's what the Bible says. It's a peace that passeth all understanding. Yeah. That's why when, when I put $4 worth of gas in, if I put in $40 and just make it to Paris and back, you know what, it's going to be okay. I don't know how it's going to be okay, but I know it's going to be okay. Yeah. Look, look beyond this. And so as Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica, he says, don't be stressed about the ones that died in the faith. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, do you believe it? That is the very picture of the victory over death. If ye believe that Jesus died and rose again, he has the victory. He's got the victory over death. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. He had seen the Lord Jesus Christ on more than one occasion. We know that he saw him when he was in the prison. We know that he saw him on the road to Damascus. And somewhere, and it probably was more times than that. I don't know. I know those two are recorded for our benefit. And he whispered in his ear and says, Paul, I'm coming back. I I'm going to return. And it's going to be along these lines. When, when the believers get upset about death and facing, and facing death, you remind them of this. And, and with that, he, he, he passes it on to Thessalonica. You ever wondered about the church churches that didn't get this? As, as a nurse, do I give an antibiotic to someone who doesn't have an infection? <laughs> Certainly not. They don't need it, right? Do I give a blood pressure to pill, pill to people who have normal blood pressures? No, they don't need it. These two groups were stressed about eternity. They were stressed about people who had died in the faith. And so they were stressed about it, so they got the message. So it says to me that the church at Ephesus and the churches of Galatia, apparently they weren't stressed about death. Apparently they weren't too stressed about uh, what was going on uh, after death would occur. But these individuals were, and so with that, the Lord Jesus gave them the very thing they need. For with this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain 
<laughs> until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Amen. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What a sweet comfort, is it not? Yeah. Knowing you die in Christ, and immediately to be home with the Lord Jesus Christ. Back to this flesh, I can't imagine what the new body may be like. Because I struggle with this one every day. And the older you get, in addition to carnality and worldly thoughts and wondering about this and wondering about that, this thing begins to fall apart uh, uh, eventually. I see this thing on Facebook that says you better enjoy your 20s and 30s and 40s because if when you're 50s, that check engine light is going to come on. Yeah. And uh, it certainly does. <laughs> and uh, just, a sign, just a sign that the Lord God was right all the time. <laughs> right? Uh, put your trust and your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that's the only hope you have.